All right, 89 goals scored at the group stage of the Africa Cup of Nations. So many exciting games. Knockout stage is upon us. And of course, if you remember what happened in 2021 in Cameroon, about two, about, yeah, about uh, how many goals were scored? 69. I mean, just take a look at the difference. So it simply means this Nations Cup, just one of the best that I ever hosted. I don't know how they're going to continue with this, but it's on record that 89 goals have been scored 2.5 per game. That's an average of the goals scored so far. So it's a tournament of goals, tournament of shocks, and of course, a tournament of the underdogs. Welcome to Sport Tonight. I'm Cecilia Morogbe in Lagos. Sport greetings to you wherever you are in the world watching us in London. I'm Austin Okonakwan. Cecilia, what can I say about this year's AFCON? What a story, you know? I told you guys I love upsets, I love oddity, and then this African said, Austin, don't worry, sit back, relax, and enjoy. <laughs> I love everything that I've seen at this competition, and I just hope that right after this, countries in Africa we see the need to develop their football, mm -hmm. because we're beginning to tell a beautiful story yeah. with our football, and we must sustain this momentum. We must sustain it, because this is what the show is like tonight. We'll be talking about... Of course, the Africa Cup of Nations, that will obviously get our attention. Talk about the coaches that have been fired, about six of them. One country is still in the tournament, but they, will, they don't have a coach, of course. They're already looking for one. But the assistant coach will be sitting in. I'm talking about the host nation that were beaten by Kutera Guinea. Four goes to nothing, right there on their home court. And also, we'll take a look at boxing. Yes, boxing. When we talk about mm -hmm. boxing, yes, talk about the men most times. But this time around, we'll be having... A female boxer, Andy Building, that will be telling us her journey to success. I mean, the first Nigerian to win a world title. You can't beat that. Yes, we'll be talking to her on the show tonight. Of course, we're not alone on the program. Bolo is also here. Mm -hmm. It's a Tuesday. Bolo, I mean, AFCON has been wonderful. <laughs> I don't know the tournaments of persons I've been watching, but this has to go down as the most exciting, most intriguing, most interesting Africa Cup of Nations ever. Mm. We've seen lots and lots of upsets. We have Africa Cup of Nations. Tunisia finished fourth in their group. <laughs> we have AFCON. Algeria finished fourth in their group. We have AFCON. Ghana couldn't go through the group stages. Again. We have AFCON where the elite in quotes are falling behind. I remember uh, last time around when Comoros made it to the knockout stage. Oh, it's a fluke. The same man here that took Comoros came again with Mauritania this time. He's also in the next round. It just shows we have talent. We have these things in Africa. How can we handle it? It's always been the major challenge. Hopefully we get to do this thing, right? Because this is definitely a big mess to the rest of the world. Well, if you think you can underrate Africa, just focus on this AFCON. Have you heard any controversy about VR so far? No, because the world is watching, waiting for them to make mistakes. And I like that all through the group stages, every time the VR has been used, it's been positive and positive news. Hopefully, we'll continue like this for the rest of the competition. Hopefully, it continue like that. But we will not delve into AFCON yet. We'll be talking mm -hmm. boxing tonight. Yes, that's, right. that's where we'll Cecilia, start you know. Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah, when you were trying to, you know, talk about uh, this fantastic female boxer that will soon introduce to our viewers, you know, you saw the one I was smiling because I love the story. Yeah. Uh, we always come talk about the men, the men, the men, and we know that the women, they always do their bit, you know, uh, to, to represent Nigeria. The Commonwealth Games, you know, I can't stop saying it. All of the gold medals we won. The women did it when the Super Falcons play. We know they will do well, the Falconers, the Flamingos. And each time we have an opportunity to bring women to the spotlight, we do that just to the government. We know that if you do good for the men, you must do better for the women. Let's introduce Elizabeth Oshoba. She is Nigeria's first female world boxing champion. I'll say it again. She's Nigeria's first female world boxing champion. As she hails from Ikarea Koko in Ondo State, Southwest Nigeria, she became a professional boxer just in 2022, November yes. to be precise, right after she won silver at the Commonwealth Games uh, in Birmingham in 2022. I spoke to Elizabeth right after she won silver and she said she wanted gold and that the world We'll hear from her. Yes, indeed. The world is talking about her now, Cecilia, because on January the 13th, right there in Copenhagen, Denmark, she defeated Italy's Michela Braga to become the WBC Silver World Featherweight Champion. You know what? 
She's right here in the United Kingdom with me. She's in Bristol. Let's welcome the champ. Good evening, Elizabeth. Welcome to Sports Tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Awesome. Good to have you on the show. Congratulations. We are super duper proud of you for what you've done for not just yourself or your family, but for Nigeria and the continent of Africa. You are the Thank you, very UBC much. Silver World Featherweight Champion. Has this sunk in yet? How did you make it happen? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's just by the grace of God, you know. It's by the grace of God and um, um, with the hard work, dedication and prayer. I think that is what really makes it happen. How difficult was that fight against Michela Braga? Um... Um, to be to be honest, it was not an easy fight. It was a difficult and a tough fight, you know, because um, I was noticed. Um, I I got a short notice, two weeks notice. I really got for the fight, and you know, it was a festive period. December time. That is when I get the the call that I need to fight in Denmark on January thirteenth. So it was um, December around um, Christmas period. So I was just at home, you know, trying to enjoy my holiday, enjoy my Christmas. <laughs> you get so. My manager just called me, oh, wow, you need to pick up your shoes. You need to get ready now. We're having a big fight in Denmark, January 13th. So I was like, wow, I can do this. Then he asked me, can you do it? I said, yes, I'll do it. By the grace of God, I'll do it, you know. It was a short notice, so that makes it a bit more um, tough, the fight, you understand. You know, I had to train, I had to, I had to shed weight, you understand. So it makes it a little bit tough for me, but... I know I'm going to win. I believe myself because of the hard work I've been putting in during the training, you know, because I had my um, previous fight before the one of January 13th on the November 25th. That was when I get the IBO title. So let's talk about your journey into professional boxing. I saw you in Birmingham during the Commonwealth Games yes. and I asked you what you wanted. You said you were going to win gold for your fans in Nigeria and for your boxing career. But you won silver. That experience in Birmingham, you took it and you became a pro boxer in November 2022. Did that experience at the Commonwealth Games motivate you also? Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, it's really, really motivate me because I was not really happy I got the silver, uh, you know. I would thank God I won the silver medal, but I want I was aiming for the good. I was going for the good, so I wasn't happy. So then it came out that way that I had to go with the silver. But it's really, really motivate me, you know, to go more because I don't like when I lose. I don't like losing. You understand? As in Nigeria, now we know they carry last. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Let me hand it over to Cecilia in Lagos. <laughs> okay. Uh, Elizabeth, you know, your story is very remarkable. You won silver at the Commonwealth Games and then you became a professional. And 2024, now you are a world title holder. What was the journey like for you? How did you, you know, get into boxing? And of course, why boxing of all sports? <laughs> um, actually, um, I'm a sport lover right from day one. You understand? I love sports so much, but not boxing. I started boxing, let me say, 11 years ago when I was um, like 13 years because I was 24 now. So I started 11 years ago. So when I started, it's just it's just so funny how I started because my brother just went out and he came back and he was like, huh? he saw a boxing gym, a local boxing gym in my area at um, Tigoilu. So to be able to be precise, it was like, I, w I would like you to, to do it because I saw a girl, she was really, really like you, like the way you were slim and all that. I was like, no, I don't want to do boxing. No, I don't want to spoil my face. But due to my parents, they love sport. They love sport. They really, really love sport as well. So yeah. my dad, you know, my dad was like, OK, let's go. Then he put me in the car. He doesn't tell me we are going to the boxing gym. You know I won't follow him, yeah? He just <laughs> told me I need to follow him to somewhere. So I jumped in the car, then he took me to the boxing gym. It was a local gym. So when I got there, I saw some females, you know, I saw some girls boxing as well, boxers. I was like, wow. So if these people see me outside, they will, will they beat me or what? So I said, uh, no, I'll do it. I'll do this. Then that is how I started. Then I have passion for it. I love it. Then I started going on my own. And that is how all the story started. In interesting. I, I know that some people will tell you, you know, when they started sport, they had people they look forward to. When you now understand that, yes, it's boxing for you, 
who were you looking up to? Do you have a role model or the, uh, some of the boxers you look up to you know, before you became a world champion? Um, yeah, I have a role model. Like, um, I have a Mayweather. Um, I do look at him like the way, you know, he's a world champion and everything about him. I like everything about him, the way he fights, the way he boxes, and actually um, Clarissa Shield as well. Okay. So when I, I want to do this boxing, like I want to take it as my profession. So I love Clarissa Shield as well because um, she, because of her power, you know, she has the power, she has courage. So I watch her really, really well as well. So those are my role models. No wonder you're seven and oh, undefeated, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Austin. I like it. I like it. You know, when, when you said, um, is it Tigbo Ilu to the world, you know? So, yeah. Tigbo land in Songwata, Ogun State, Southwest Nigeria, I'm sure. They will be so proud of you. And that's that's where I want to to, to stay. What a journey. Um, you're from Ondo State, but you started boxing at 13 at Songwata in Ogun State. Do you have inspiring story from that experience growing up there and now you are the world champion? Uh, yes, yes, because, um, you know, um, I'm from a poor background and the area is just, you know, a local area where I started Smart Boxing Club. That is where I started my boxing career. So it was a, a local place and no equipment, no facilities, you understand. So we just had to rough it. You, again, then we just put um, sand, you know, the sand inside the punching bag you get. That is what mm. we punched. So it has not been easy. It was very, very tough, you know. Being in Nigeria and doing boxing, you have, you you got some people discouraging you. A lot of discouragement. You understand? They will discourage you. Like maybe guys will be telling you, "Oh, ladies, you are going for boxing. What are you seeing there?" You understand? A lot of people, a lot of talk, a lot of side talks, but you won't actually look that side. So the journey wasn't easy. It was very very tough because there is no sponsor. There is no one to help you. You just do your yeah. thing. You get at times uh we'll go to gym with my coach we'll we'll go to because i started boxing for lagos state then lagos state boxing hall of fame so at times from Ogun state from songo we had to go to lagos at um yaba site mubola g johnson um also so we had to go there without eating you know without eating at times at times that we won't have money even all this conductor will be like Oh, you guys should not laugh. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Don't laugh on my. Don't laugh in our boss. You understand? We don't want laughing. I will laugh with my coach. We will, we will all go there because we want to go and box because we want to go and watch boxing. You understand? So, it's it's a very very tough journey. It's a, I, I won't lie to you. It's not easy. But I just had wow. to. End. I just had to end it wow. because I just, and I know one day I'm gonna become a world champion. I have to believe in myself. And mm. most people most people that we started some some people cannot. You know, they cannot go, f they cannot continue with the struggling, you understand? They just have to stop because there is no one to help, there is no one to support. But I just keep going, I just keep doing it. That one day I'm going to become a world champion because I believe in myself that I'll actually be, become one. Wow, what an inspiring story. What a motivational story. Thank you so much for not giving up. And you're just 24, 24. You're world champion. You turned pro in 2022. You've already announced yourself to the world. What else should we expect from Elizabeth? Um, I think it's not it's not gonna stop there. I'm still gonna keep trying. Gonna keep going because I haven't gotten there yet. You understand? I I still want to win the world title, the WBC world title. You understand? This is the one I'm, WBC silver. So I still want to go for the world title and that's actually where I'm going. I want to be like number one. I want to have all the titles in my weight. So I keep striving. I keep going. I'm still going. I'm not stopping yet. You guys, you expect, you guys you expect more from me, 100%. We are. Yeah. We are. And we are rooting for you, Cecilia. I'm sure you're doing the same. Yeah, obviously <laughs> we are rooting for you from here. But before we let you go, what advice will you give to those boxers who was trying and striving to be, you know, to be someone like you in the future. And if you can tell us the story, how did you end up in the UK from Nigeria here? Um, actually, when I, um, I, I met my manager, that's Sean Murray. 
I met him online. I think he saw some of my videos. So he was like, he messaged me and we started talking. So he was like, he wants to manage me, something like that. So I told him, no, I, if he can hold on because I need to represent my country, you get. Then unfortunately we missed um, the Olympics game, the last Olympics game. Boxing did not go for the Olympic qualifier. So yeah. I was uh, at the camp then. So I qualified for the um, national team. So actually um, they didn't really go for the qualifier. So I missed the Olympics. So I told my manager, okay, I want to go for the Commonwealth Games. Then he said, okay, that's fine. He's going to wait. He's going, for, he's going to wait for me. So since then he's been following my journey at the Commonwealth Games. He was there as well. He came all the way from his side to Birmingham to watch my fight. Like he came almost every day. So he's a good person. He's, he's, he's there. So that was how I met him. So then from there, after the Commonwealth Games, we pick up, we pick it up from there. It was like, do you want to turn pro now? Then I think it's the right time for me to turn pro because I know in the professional levels, that is where I really belong to because yeah. I know that is where I'm going to become the world champion. You understand? So I told him, okay, I'm ready. Mm. So that's how we started everything. Then he invited me after the Commonwealth Games. I went back to Nigeria. Then he invited me back into the UK. So that was how we started the whole thing, the whole professional stuff. Wow. All right, a message Shout to out the to teenagers Sean out there. Sean, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for your, su for your support. We'll continue to tell this beautiful story of Elizabeth Oshoba. Hopefully we'll see Sean and find a way to, you know, get Sean to also uh, say he's part of his story for contributing to uh, this fantastic achievement of Elizabeth. Cecilia, you wanted her to go, but I think um, <laughs> uh, we still want her to, to drop words yeah. of inspiration for young boxers, yeah. particularly young female boxers like yourself. Because we know the stereotyping is still going on back home. People are like, oh, you still of you to do something serious. You want to go and become a boxer. What do you have to say to them? And now you're in the United Kingdom. You've seen how things are done professionally. What do you want to say to the Boxing Federation, to the government of Nigeria, so that we can, you know, develop boxing in Nigeria? Um, actually, what I'll say to the young ones coming, I would like to... To, to to tell them not to give up, you understand? No matter how the situation, they should not give up on their dreams. They should keep pursuing their dreams. They should not give up. No matter how it is today, tomorrow is going to be okay. It's going to be fine tomorrow. They should not just keep up, give up. They should just keep striving, keep going. And one day, their also is going to pay. Hmm. And for your federation and the government... <laughs> Nigeria Federation, I would like to I would like to, to plead with the government, like they should at least they should help boxing as well, the way they are help they the way they are helping um football, the way they are listening giving uh, listening here to footballs, like they should help boxers as well, like they should provide us um good facilities, like good equipment and I think with that and you know, most of the boxers, most of the boxers at the national level, they should try and, you know, maybe they'll put them on salary, they'll place them on salary every month and, you know, there's no one to support. Like, I've been there, nobody to support even. And with this boxing, you can't say you want to go and be doing some other things aside. I mean, in Nigeria, you can't say you want to because if you really, really want to become a champion, you have to be focused on boxing 100%. You cannot cheat. Mm understand you cannot cheat in boxing like you can't say okay yeah. i want to go and do some stuff again like i want to go and be walking or because when i was boxing i don't have the chance to walk because i know if i walk it's going to distract me from boxing because i realize yeah i want to go to work today i won't be able to train then how do i want to become the world champion how do i want to become yeah. a champion? when they are somewhere someone out there training every day going to the gym every day so will i say i want to go to work five days and go to the gym two days how will I gain the, you understand, how will I become the champion? How, how do I want to do that? So I did not do any work. So I base, I do only boxing because it's wow. my profession. Nothing right. is there, but I just keep doing it because I believe mm -hmm. the Ozu is going to pay off. So yeah. if they can try and help, like maybe, I know we have a lot of boxers in Nigeria, but maybe the ones at the national level, you understand, they should just try yeah. if, they can be giving them some things like salary every month for them to survive. Yeah. People out there, they really want to boss, but because they don't have 
they don't have this um they don't have something to 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 keep them you know they have to go and work they have to go back to work yeah. and go and work and they left whatever they are doing at the gym they leave everything concerning boxing then they went to work so i'll just play with the government and do that and provide some equipment as well training facilities so i yeah. think we are yeah. good to go like we have a lot of champions in nigeria a lot a lot of champions that they can become world champions too uh, and support them wbc silver world featherweight champion elizabeth oshoba thank you so much for your time on the show you've got an inspiring story we'll continue to tell the world and i hope you stay focused and keep ruling your world thank you so much for your time on our show tonight thank you very much i really appreciate it. thank you so that's it uh, elizabeth oshoba speaking to us uh, from our base in bristol united kingdom what a story we'll continue to tell it because it is one that can inspire young persons not just in nigeria but all over the world. That's it. Let's go on this quick break. Now, when we come back, everything going down right there at the Africa Cup of Nations in Cote d'Ivoire. We get our attention. Don't go anywhere. Stay. Hey. Tonight on channels, television, just gone by our exclusive interview with WBC silver featherweight world champion elizabeth oshoba wait let me say it again wbc <laughs> silver featherweight world champion is a nigerian she's just 24 years old cecilia that's a beautiful story it's it's inspiring i love it so much and i just hope she continues to you know uh, tell us beautiful stories and empower young persons all over the world yeah i love the message that she also passed to the government and also those in charge of boxing in Nigeria. Remember when they could not even go to qualifiers for boxing towards the Olympics? We're all talking about it. And now, I mean, she had to take advantage of the Commonwealth Games. And this is what she is today. Just imagine they've gone to the Olympics. Do you know how many boxers would have produced from there and how many would no. be at top level mm. today? Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and see what, you know, the future sure. holds for boxing in Nigeria, especially the young girl out there who is dreaming to become a world champion. She's already got a role model for, from uh, a Nigerian role model. You don't have to look so far to get that. But Austin, let's get into the business of let's Africa Cup of Nations. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, and, and each time we talk about the Africa Cup of Nations, there's a lot of head scratching, nail biting. Mm -hmm. uh, did you mm -hmm. believe it? Do you know this happened to Ghana? What happened to Algeria happened again? What happened last edition happened again. It's crazy, but I love it, Cecilia. I love this story, and I just hope that we'll see more upsets in the round of 16. How about that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We wanted to just get into the business of the Africa Cup of Nations. Yeah. Apparently, someone is not following me. Okay, Bolo, you're here. I mean, the heavyweights are out. I mean, when I mean heavyweight, you talk about Algeria, you talk about Tunisia. But now we have the teams that are into the round of 16. Maybe we'll start off with the fixtures for the round of 16. And after that, we'll get to listen to what Nigerian players are thinking ahead of the Africa Cup of Nations. Now, on Saturday, this is how it all starts. Yeah, it's going to start with a game between Angola and Namibia. That's 6 p.m. before Nigeria match, which is 9 p.m. that everyone will be looking forward to. Nigeria and Cameroon, we will dissect that on the program after uh, taking a look at the round of system fixtures. Now let's go to Sunday, the games for Sunday. And that's where you have other heavyweights in action. Equatorial Guinea and Guinea uh, would be in action. The two Guinea teams, Guinea Bissau, they've gone home. Egypt and Diaro Congo will also be in action on Sunday. Now let's, let's flip over to the games for Monday and the teams that are in action for Monday. Are Cape Verde and Mauritania. Now this team are making, they won their first Africa Cup of Nations after the third attempt and it was against 2019 champions Algeria and of course they are in the round of 16. Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. I know this is another game to look forward to. The host nation, the last host nation and the present host nation who lost to Equatorial Guinea for new at home. All right, the game is for Tuesday. We'll wrap up the round of 16. Mali and Burkina Faso will be in action. And Morocco and South Africa will conclude that round of 16 matches. Now, it's the Super Eagles of Nigeria and Cameroon. And that's where we start off because, you know, when you're talking about the Super Eagles of Nigeria, there's so, I mean, how, where do you start from? Because the players, the coaches, 
yes, we've been scoring one one game, but then something might just happen. So, so much that the coach also Pesera has become a pastor at the funeral service. God give it and God tip it, uh, gives points, takes points, and uh, all. It, someone said it's becoming Nigerian, uh, but the truth is. Beyond what we, the most important thing in football is to win, yeah. which you have to give the team credit for. Yes, they are not scoring enough. Like I told some person, all the goals Nigeria scored at this AFCON were scored by Cameroon only in their last match. Cameroon won that game three to Nigeria scored three, and it's only one goal from open play, which was the header the equalizer for Simon in the first game. Second game was a penalty. Can I can I, can I pause you there? You know, Pesero said, uh, Algeria, um, Senegal scored one one goal and got out of the group stage and then went on to win the Africa Cup of Nations. So we've started in that process. So we're following the footsteps of Senegal. Okay, let's see what happens against Cameroon, first of all, because like I said, Cameroon, so far so good, they've been better goal scorers. Yeah. Not that they've been brilliant all through. Remember, they struggled. They qual Nigeria qualified even before the final match. They needed their last match before they could qualify. And the good news for them, their captain, Vincent Abubaka, is back yeah. in the squad. But Pesera has assured Nigerians that the team will score more goals in the knockout stage. Even if they are not scoring, even if they are playing goalless and winning their penalties, Nigerians don't care. We may complain about how they are not playing, but Nigerians just want them to go far in the tournament. And as much as we've seen stories of Cameroon have beaten Nigeria well, that's pure fallacy. In about 25 games between the two nations, Cameroon have won just four or five games. Yes, they've won important games, semi-finals, finals, but in about 25 matches, they've won just four or five matches against Nigeria. It means all the talks of Cameroon being Nigerian steady is not true. Mm -hmm. But this time around, this is pure business. Group stage, you have second chance or maybe third chance. In the knockout stage, it's one or zero. It's like binary. You either win or you lose. Hopefully, okay. Super Eagles will be on the first side, which is the win. Mm, interesting. Uh, you, you know, when you've beaten a team, I mean, so many times, and the crucial ones are the ones you remember. <laughs> the reason why we're talking about that, three finals, out of the five, Cameroon has won. I'm talking about the Nations Cup. They beat Nigeria three times, three times in that. That's more painful. Austin, I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, let's listen to the players first before Austin will come in. We'll listen to Kenneth Omeru and also listen to Bright Osai Samuel talking ahead of the game against Cameroon on Saturday. Bye. Obviously, Cameroon is a familiar um, face. <coughs> They're a country that we've played several times before. A country with good, um, good players for, you know, with focus, with training. And uh, I think by the time the game gets closer, we, you know, we believe in the coaches to provide us with the best tactics to, to win the game. Uh, we're confident, you know, after the last game, we said to ourselves, wherever we get next, uh, we have, just have to keep to our game plan, take it 100% and, you know, we can beat any team. Uh, my message is for them to fly to every coast, you know, it's visa free, come and support us. In general, I think we played well, um, of course we uh, had a clean sheet, uh, another one in the South Con, so it's positive in terms of um, the defence. Um, I think collectively, you know, we had many chances again. Um, I think our aim now is just, it's just that we know, of course, we get chances every game with the quality that we have. And I think it's now about converting these chances now. So, um, yeah, I think overall the game was good and um, it's a learning curve now to see what we can improve to, um, to do better against um, our next game against Cameroon. Of course, now it's, uh, it's knockouts, you know, so um, there's, no, there's no free points now. It's either you win and you're through or if you lose, you're out. So we know that comes with pressure. But um, like I said, I think if you look at um, in our group, we have players with vast experience, you know, in this in this um, you know in this situation that we're in now. I think we have the players that can you know thrive in, in this in this situation. So um, I think if you look around the group, everyone's confident. Um, everyone's looking forward to the game. Me myself, and um, you know, Cameroon are a very strong team. You know, they've got good players. Uh, but like I said, I think. We've, we focus on ourselves and um, look at what we can do and how we can hurt them, then I think we have a very good chance of winning the game. Austin, in one of the finals that we lost to Cameroon was in Lagos here, 2000. And of course, the current coach of Cameroon was in that squad, Rigobert, a song. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Cecilia, what a story, you know, but I've, I've been trying to, you know, keep it away from history. Uh, when talking about this Saturday's fixture between Nigeria and Cameroon. And yes, people say, oh, you're running away from me. It's part, part of it must come from, part of the statistics must come from what has happened in the past. And yeah. I say no, because football in Africa 
It's changing. How would you explain what's going on with Algeria after winning the AFCON in 2019? What have been of their football? You know, I even look at Egypt at this AFCON. You know, they'll be singing and dancing that they're not out yet. Uh, now, let's go to Cameroon. Cameroon had every opportunity to beat Guinea in their opening group game, and they couldn't, despite having numerical advantage. Yeah. So it means that they don't really know how to take chances. That's one. Mental strength is not really there. That's yeah. two. And um, whether or not we like it, administration affects what happens on the field of play. They are struggling with administration of football in Cameroon. I think that's, that's just enough for Nigeria to, you know, just look at it and see ways that they can get into it. This guy is under so much pressure. We go yeah. son to, you know, Keep this team together. There's mild drama going on between him and Onana also. Uh, there's the Eto drama by the sideline also and some other pa uh, members of the FA. But people say, stay with the football. Yes, let's stay with the football. Against Senegal, they were taught footballing lesson. I don't think Senegal would beat Nigeria the way they did in that 3-1 win over Cameroon. And we know how they just won it by the whiskers against Gambia, you know, and that's why they are here. So people will come out again to me and say, Austin, where the Super Eagles fantastic, by virtue of what we saw in the group phase, the Super Eagles had a better performance than Cameroon. They got seven points and they were able to, you know, win when they needed to win. And of course, also uh, stay relevant in that other group A table. So going by that, and everything that Kenneth Omeru said, and Bright Osai Samuel, talking about the quality that they have, talking about how pumped this team is towards playing Cameroon, talking about ways that they want to keep getting better, because for them, it's all about sustaining the momentum. I think pressure is on Cameroon to come out of, when they file out of Saturday. The Super Eagles, they just need to keep their mental strength going. They need to play more as a team now and learn to, you know, play without the breaks on. I think they need to be more daring. Yes, I understand Pizero is trying not to take chances, but they need to be creative in the middle just so Victor Simen can get more supplies and do stuff, you know. I, I think um, it's going to be a very pretty difficult game, but the team that comes out with character, good show of mental strength, that will stay focused and play purposeful football, will come out to win. Cecilia. And the good thing is that Nigeria is sound defensively. I mean, you see teams like Egypt who have considered like six goals in the last three tournaments. They considered six in only this. So Nigeria defensively, we are solid. Where your defense is solid and the attackers are scoring, uh, Bolu, of course, obviously, you win games. I think it's That's one, how it goes. This is one of the headache um, Pesero will have for the next round because now, uh, from what we heard, uh, Tristan Kong is back in training. Yeah. Obviously, if he's maintaining the same formation, go back to what we had against Africa. But now, Alassane Yusuf is also back in training. So the question now is, will he go back to the formation of playing in the opening game with Alassane Yusuf there, or he'll go maintain this 3-4-3? If he maintains that 3-4-3, it means someone will have to sit in the midfield. Will it be Alex Wobi? Will it be Frank Winka? These are things I expect the coach would have sorted by now, observed the training, try one or two things should I try out two men up front you know sometimes come up with the element of yeah. surprise and let them if it's a promise and assure that they will score goals it means they probably has some extra things in the back like um, the player rightly said as well Saisa Mo, no second chances this time around it's either you win or you're eliminated you can score a hundred penalties each someone mm -hmm. will have to lose at the end of the day like I said earlier really, hopefully it's not Nigeria and you have to agree hundred percent with Austin about you may or may not like the performance of the Super Eagles, but compared to Cameroon, Nigeria were better. And in terms of when they beat us in the last final in 2000, some of these guys who were not even born there. Yeah. The ones that were born are probably third last in those. So it means what happened then is probably not playing in their mind. It's the last time many of these guys or some of them played against Cameroon, at the AFCON was in 2019 or 2021, and Nigeria won that game. So if there's a history they want, yeah. that should be something that will be ringing in their mind. We've done it before, we can also do it again. Mm -hmm. Let's do it again. That's his slogan. All right, let's take a look at the coaches that have been fired, unprecedented, fired or resigned <laughs> or leaving the post. Six <laughs> of them, Adam Morich, I mean, started it. I mean, he was suspended by CAF for six games. And of course, the coach had to let him go. But let's start with the Algeria coach. Yes, this was expected at the Africa Cup of Nations. Remember, this was the coach that actually led them to the Africa Cup of Nations in 2019. He won the title and they came back in the next edition. What happened? They crashed out at the group stage. And this time around, again, the same coach 
and he had to leave his position. So Jamel Bamandi is no longer the coach of Algeria. And this is what he did at this AFCOM. Three games, he did not win any. I mean, drawing two and of course losing one. And that's why you have the Algerians are going home. And that's why he was fired. Then let's look at the other one. Uh, the next coach, of course, Jean-Louis Gasset. That's the coach of Cote d'Ivoire. That's where the problem is right now. They suffered their heaviest defeat at home at this Nations Cup. Four goes to nothing against Equatorial Guinea. At the games he was in charge, it was a three. One, one, of course, losing a two. They qualified based on the fact that Zambia could not get anything off Morocco and, of course, Tanzania, uh, Tanzania and DR Congo. And that's the reason why they were able to make it to this run. If Zambia had uh, maybe had a draw or even, you know, had a good game against Morocco, maybe winning, the Americans would have been out. But they are into the round of 16. Of course, you know the team that they will be facing. Maybe they will be ready to pack the well, Cecilia, we will meet Cote d'Ivoire now that they've sacked their coach. <laughs> Exactly. It's, so what do you say? Who will lead Cote d'Ivoire now that they've sacked their coach? <laughs> Who will lead them? They, they have the, the they have three assistants, so the yes. third one will be in charge, uh, or will be sitting right there to lead the team in the game against Senegal. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> So let's look at Chris Hitty, the coach of Ghana, after three really games the second time in a row, the Africa Cup of Nations, Ghana leaving at the group stage. Of course, they did not win any, losing one and drawing two. And that's why Chris Hitton was asked to go. So he's being fired. Let's take a look at not Tom Sempiet. He had to leave his position. He resigned after three games, of course, three losses. And this is a very experienced coach. But the Gambia, thinking they'll get something out of this Nations Cup, couldn't get anything out of it. Tunisia, of course, that's another country you expect them to also go far at this tournament. And this is the result of Jali Kadri. And when you have this result, that's how he had to leave his position. So these are the coaches that have left at the Africa Cup of Nations, of course. Why one is still in there, the others have gone. Now let's quickly, you know, take a look at these coaches, the record. Do you think maybe some of them were really harsh, you know? letting their coaches leave or they should have just maintained especially their very own coach for some of them it's like pedigree for example at same field maybe he had a standard for himself that this is what i want to achieve if i do not get it i have to go but i think like austin rightly said the biggest surprise has to be every coach you guys had a chance to qualify yeah why <laughs> let go of the code now there are some reports i don't know how true that uh, they're Renan. writing to france uh, to get a very not on loan and everything like so every not was you know he was at afcon i saw his i saw him so <laughs> He's when, watching you the knew game. this drama would come why do you wait till now so sometimes you think out of the box you yeah. think out of time now their game is in a few days they do not even know yeah fire who is the uh, legend of the country is the one in charge for now temporarily Obviously, we'll be the one training the players. So when every that assistant. comes, yeah. suddenly, oh, okay, I'm the one in charge. So even before playing the Senegal game, it feels like they've lost already before the match. But uh, it's sports, it's football, anything can set up. And Belmadi, that guy's record with the national team is huge. Yeah. I think he had about over 30 games unbeaten at some point. But since they lost their first game at the last AFCON, it's been from one poor result to another, more draws than losses. He just lost their six games overall. But in the end, some said he was sacked, some said he resigned. But the fact is, he's not with the national team anymore. This is what some of these guys do okay i can't meet up the standard i think i set for myself or the country let me just step there i don't think some of these guys are a big surprise except the ivorians who had the chance to qualify now they've qualified but they let go of the coach before playing right it feels like um <laughs> sports sacking jose morio before the carabao cup finally led them to them <laughs> <laughs> Austin, I mean, when you look at it, yeah. you were asking the question is going to take charge. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's unprecedented. I don't know how many countries have done that. We'll have to look at, the, we have to check, we have to look at the statistics and look at the facts. How many countries in the tournament, we understand that's of Tanzania and everything because it was suspended by CAF for eight games. They felt, okay, fine, you have no business being with us anymore because you will not be there. But this one, it's shocking. Yeah, you know, uh, with Cote d'Ivoire, I think, yeah, it was a painful experience. You know, as host, you just want to do just enough to stay at the competition. So with everything that happened, look, even the coach does not even need to be sacked. He should just take a walk because uh, that defeat to Equatorial Guinea was just, it was humiliating, you know, for the fans, for everybody. You know, I saw Drogba, if you, if you just try to touch him or start crying, you know, Solomon Kalu, same thing. Everybody was just in a very sober mood. So, yes, I, I totally understand why they had to let go 
of the coach, Chris Hutzin. I called it, I said it, that if they don't win their last game against Mozambique, he should just pack his bags and go because it is not working, whatever it is he brought you know, to Ghana football. I just feel bad for two coaches, Jamel Belmadi of Algeria and Tom Sainfield of Gambia. I say this because uh, the work Belmadi has done with this Algerian side you start wondering why what is wrong why they not get to the result because it's a decent team and i've attributed it to maybe they just don't know how to play on bad surfaces because the algerian team if you see the way they play their football it's all about running into spaces and touching those balls easily some same field and the gambia i liked what they did at the last edition in cameroon i thought they were going to give us more upset but cecilia i remember what happened yeah. to when they got to Cote d'Ivoire the plane issue and all of that, I think mentally that affected their campaign. And and that's why, you know, they went down, you know, with three defeats. So, yeah, coaches are hired to be fired, Cecilia. Six. In the tournament that is still going on, <laughs> just group stage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Moroccan uh, teams are not... You, you, okay, let's look at the teams, of course, that didn't fire their coaches. Morocco is one of them. I mean, Morocco, they've had a descent on... Look, I mean... It's, uh, it's a team, one of the favorites coming into this tournament. There's Mali there also. I mean, there's Senegal, of course, also another team. But the Moroccan team are coming here. Yes, you would say we wanted them to have like a 100% record. When you see the group they were in, you think, oh, they're going to have a 100% record. But somehow, they stumble a little bit. But Moroccans are in the, uh, in the round of 16, of course. South Africa. Is your opponent? Should South Africa be afraid? The Moroccans are coming. <laughs> South, South, South Africans, they are not uh, more like, remember, this is their first half corner. I think they missed the last two editions. Uh, for Morocco, they drew their first match, but they picked themselves up in the next two games. We thought the third match would probably be a draw, so every coast can remain at home, but they got the necessary because sometimes it plays in the mind as well. Like Austin always says, sometimes you win your game in yeah. any sports off the field, even before you get to the field of play. And that's exactly what Morocco did. They knew what they needed to do. Now they are where they want to be. Against the Saturday, not even I think, they are the better opposition against the Bafana, Bafana players. And uh, they need to show it on the field of play. See what Senegal are doing to their position. Immediately Senegal gets to the field of play, they start their dominance. So you will know we are the best. So you know we are the bosses. Don't even have any mindset of thinking of a comeback. I and mean, with the way the sides are placed, it feels like everything is aligning for a Morocco or Senegal final. And that's probably what many football fans want to watch. Morocco on one side, Senegal on one side, that will be a worthy final. But if you don't get there, there's nothing worthy about the final. It is who gets to the final that matters. Look at Ivory Coast, the man they lost for a nil. Like why we say football is only winning. And to win, you have to score. Ivory Coast had over 70% possession yeah. in that game, about 20 shots, and they did not win. So you can possess all the ball as much as you want. It is who puts the ball on the back of the net that really matters. And probably that's what Morocco had to do in their last match. It was a hard-fought win, but they won. Now, for, not just for Nigeria, it is for everyone. The knockout face is a do-or-die affair, not literally. You have to win, or you are out of the competition. Some coaches will still go. <laughs> because one thing is certain, if Nigeria do not get to the next round, Pesero is a gunner. Now, I don't know about other nations. More coaches are waiting well, to be fired. So more coaches are definitely waiting to be fired. <laughs> ah, interesting. Austin, more coaches are waiting to be fired. He wants a Morocco-Senegal final. I don't know why he wants that, but we want to do it again. Super Eagles, I mean, Nigeria and Morocco final will be good, or Senegal and Nigeria final will be preferred. It go. will be, you know, Cecilia. <laughs> so let's keep fingers crossed. All I don't right. know, Bolu, some people will come for you. This is round of 16. You should start speaking well of the Super Eagles of Nigeria. And Cecilia, do you know the irony? Some of these coaches that have been sacked we come to countries that we sack, for instance, Nigeria <laughs> will sack Pizero and go for Chris Hilton. So coaches are hired to be fired. Let's not forget we're also monitoring action right here in England. Fourth round of the FA Cup. One month, they are humiliating um, Swansea. I think by five goes to nothing. More action tomorrow in the FA Cup. That's the show. In London, I'm Austin Okonakwan. In everything you do, remember, let's keep talking sports. Bye for now. Bolo, it was nice seeing this with you. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure we'll be together by the end of the tournament. Yeah, yeah. of course. We'll be here. And of course, we'll be celebrating the Spragos of Nigeria. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Cecilia Mogbe. Have a good night, guys.